so this is an event organized by Effective Animal Altruism Stockholm, or EAA for short. Um, and we try to bring effective altruism and the animal advocacy movement together. Um, and the idea behind effective altruism is using research and evidence to do the most good in the world. So we are trying to apply that to do the most good for animals. Uh, and there is one organization that, that does a lot of that, uh, which is called uh, Animal Charity Evaluators. And they conduct evaluations of animal charities and try to find the most effective ones. And Vegan Outreach is one of their standout charities, which means it's a very effective one. We're very excited to have Victor with us today to talk about Vegan Outreach and the work they're doing. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much for the best. Thank you so much for the best. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much for coming out today. It's super nice to meet all of you. I've met some of you earlier in uh, my explorations of uh, Stockholm and all the activism here. Uh, it's super exciting to see all the cubes, the Vigomasan, all the people coming out to the demos, and hopefully there'll be more leafleting as well. Uh, Vegan Outreach, as far as ACE relates, we are a standout charity. We do have a utilitarian bent, especially our uh, outreach department. Um, uh, and to tell you a little bit of my personal journey, so we're friends and hopefully uh, how it came to working for Vegan Outreach. Um, I started out rescuing street dogs in Philadelphia while I was still eating meat part of the time. Uh, then I saw earthlings and uh, my friends would ask me like, what would you do if someone hurt your dog? And I'd be like, well, I would hurt them probably. Um, and then I started saying, well, why are you hurting animals three times a day? That and seeing other things, I kind of made the connection. You know, you have that dichotomy between farm animals and domestic animals. So I finally, I kind of made the connection. And I was kind of an awkward, <laughs> awkward kid. I was very shy, and uh, but I forced myself to hand out these 16-page booklets about how animals are treated in, in factory farms, and uh, that led to me working for Vegan Outreach. And uh, per, at that same time, too, we're doing a lot of work against the uh, Huntington Life Sciences and animal testing, and deeply bothered by the horrors that these poor animals go in. Uh, in um, animal testing laboratories. I believe at the time, there was 19,000 animals die a minute or, or something insane. And uh, the, a lot of these tests were, you know, medic, you can come in. I was just waiting for people. Oh, that's so kind of you to, that's so kind of you, it's a labyrinth, it's a labyrinth to get into this room. Um, so um, from animal testing it was so horrific and we dedicated so much of our time towards that. And uh, then that we had a foie gras campaign. The thinking was that if we, uh, Chicago has re recently banned foie gras in 16 countries. So we were working on a ban in Philadelphia with a bunch of restaurants. And uh, you know, we would meet with the owners. They would say, oh, we'll never give rid of the menu. We would have a demo. And uh, they'll be like, we're never giving rid of foie gras. They would call their friends in. And um, you know, 52 out of 56 restaurants did give rid of foie gras after just a few demos. Um, so that was my foray into activism. Then I heard a man by the name of John Camp speak, and he ha gave a presentation that really affected, was like oxygen to my soul. Uh, at the time, there was more government repression against animal rights activists working on animal testing. Some of my friends went to prison. Our house had been raided by the FBI right before I moved in. Uh, the FBI had come to my uh, job, spooked me a little bit. Um, but it wasn't really just a question of uh, courage or government repression, it was a question of tactics. I heard this man, John Camp, speak, and he related that 99% of animals that suffer are for food. So as horrific as all the forms of animal exploitation was, um, I thought that I could do the most good helping people go vegan. Because uh, prior to that, I had thought that I would just be a guy with 50 dogs, and you know that, that would be commendable to help those dogs. But doing outreach, you can save thousands of animals every single day. Some of the thinking being, you know, if I told anybody in this room, like, hey, by 3 p.m. tomorrow, you have to get 20 people to go vegan. How would you do that? Uh, you know, there's many different forms of advocacy that, that are effective to do. Um, we give out those 16-page color pamphlets as one of our main activities. We also do virtual reality, the screenings, which is actually funny to an activist because a lot of people cry. And uh, usually it doesn't make you happy when you cry, but for, it always brings a little joy to my soul because, you know, I think people are making the connection, you know, about how animals are treated. Uh, we do a lot of uh, presentations and we now have an outreach department towards uh, communities that have been marginalized, um, giving food giveaways, presentations, encouragements. We also have a vegan mentor program where if people want to go vegan, they can, uh, we can put them up with a mentor so they can have questions, encouragement, not feel alone if they're in the middle of nowhere where they're the only vegan or vegetarian. And um, we're also proud of uh, the, the, we also start programs in other countries. And we're very proud that we try not to come there as cultural conquistadors, telling people what to do, but we really want to empower local activists to have the resources to do really effective work. Um, I started a program in Mexico and in India, 
And uh, in India, for example, at a relatively low cost of just around $60,000, we have nine, nine staff members, and we're set to reach 600,000 students with the grassroots message of uh, veganism. Uh, we also target college students because they have more meals ahead of them. Uh, they're questioning society's values. And um, for many students around the world, they, they first start making their own meals when they leave the home and are at college. In India, they may be at home, but um, that's the demographic we, we aim for the most. Um, and in India, particularly, uh, unfortunately, it's meat eating is seen as Western, modern. So we really want to influence, help influence society before um, eating meat becomes part of the culture there of the upwardly mobile. Um, in Mexico as well, we had one employee, and uh, he, with help, interns, and volunteers, reached 600,000 people in only three years with virtual reality, a leaflet, or a speech. So, for uh, as far as like effective altruism goes, for a very low cost, um, you know, we could reach a tremendous amount of people. And uh, anecdotally, students in Mexico are among the most beautiful in the world. Very idealistic. The reception to the booklets is phenomenal. Every day, you know three to ten people want to volunteer. All these professors are like, can you give speeches in my class? I did four tours of Mexico, some of them brief. And uh, every single day, professors were like, can I get 200? Can I get 500 for my classes? So uh, uh, leafleting as a form of advocacy is particularly uh, effective in certain areas, and, and Mexico would probably be among the best. But as that relates to the first question, what if you had to get 15 people to go vegetarian by 3 p.m., what would you do? And um, I wanted the whole world to go vegan, and I know I couldn't, you know, Get, get everybody changed yesterday, but uh, it did make sense to me. You know, I could save these 50 dogs and take care of them and pick up poop from 50 animals, and that would be a, a beautiful use of my time. But with just one day of leafleting, if me and my friends get out three, 4,000 leaflets, 2,000 leaflets, um, we would have a tremendous influence on people not to harm animals. 99% of animals are raised for food. Hopefully, once you have a vegan consciousness, however you come to it, hopefully you won't go to the circus, you know, you won't buy leather. Uh, so it sort of made sense um, to advocate for veganism. And uh, by handing out leaflets, we're doing, a effect, we're doing more research studies. One of the uh, tough things has been that it's, you know, it, we want numbers for everything, but it's hard to quantify the impact of a leaflet. We don't always know, you know how much an impact that did have to make that person go vegan if they've been exposed to the message before. You know, it's hard to survey people 30 years from now because you know, these surveys have to be within four weeks. But uh, so there's yet to be a really definitive study on the efficacy of leafleting. But some of the results have been incredibly promising. Mercy for Animals used to claim for every two leaflets you hand out, it saves one farm animal over the course of time. There was a flawed study in Delaware and Maryland uh, because there was no control group. It, you know, there was a certain other lead question that they thought might not have been you know, perfect for a survey. Nevertheless, the, uh, that being said, the results were very encouraging. In that study, for every 70 leaflets you handed out, somebody went vegan vegetarian or drastically reduce their meat consumption. Um, there's been paid readership studies that the overwhelming majority of people that actually read the booklet, they switched their views of uh, factory farming and animals and saw it as a wrong. And uh, the majority of people who read a booklet, they ended up discussing the issue with their friends. So as it relates to the title of this topic, The Vegan Revolution is a Social Revolution, you know, I wish that everybody was vegan yesterday, but obviously people are not going to get this message in church, at work, in school, enough. Uh, so it's, I feel like it's up to us who are activists to sh spread this information whichever way we can. And uh, leafleting is one super effective way to help animals because it doesn't cost that much. Anyone can do it. People will change. And uh, you know, I don't by no means do I think that leafleting is a panacea, the only thing we should do, but it's definitely in like the orchestra of like effective animal rights activism. It's definitely a, you know, an important section or important uh, piece of the answer. Um, but you know, we support obviously anything that, that helps animals and gets people towards veganism. Uh, and along that vein, it's really interesting that language is so important because once you have a word, veganism, once it exists in the mind, it exists in people reality. So for millions of people, especially in the United States and in other countries, the first time they heard the word veganism was by getting a booklet. And as that relates to revolution is, if you study revolutions, knowledge, information is the beginning of any social revolution. And once people know better, they do better. There's so many things that people don't examine that I think once you've been in the movement for a while, it's very easy to 
assume that people know things. I stayed with my cousin recently in uh, Teriso, and he asked me, how do you get your protein? You know, and having talked about these issues for, you know, 12 years around the world, to me that was like almost primitive or ignorant, but, you know, he didn't know. So uh, that's why, you know, I'm going to talk about it later, how important it is for us to explain to people what actually happens on factory farms. You know, like I myself didn't think there was anything wrong with dairy, and, you know, then you learn all this stuff. Uh, so you can't assume that people know. When people know better, they tend to do better. So leafleting is a great way to reach, we reach millions of people in a relatively easy way. And if you volunteer with just a few short hours of your time, you can change several dozen people's lives forever. Um, there's some tactics with leafleting I can explain a little bit later as well. But just wanted to give you a little bird's eye view into the, the philosophy behind vegan outreach and how it relates to uh, utilitarianism to advocate for farm animals and to educate the public. Uh, and our new big project, besides getting, you know, some people now tend to know what veganism is, at least in the States, and I'm sure in Sweden as well. Our new booklet is, uh, what is speciesism? And our thinking is that um, the recidivism rates for veganism, unfortunately, are quite depressing. Uh, two years ago, I read a survey that five out of six people that claim to be vegetarian or vegan go back to eating meat at some point. Um, so why is that? Well, some, some indications would be that people that go vegan for the animals are the people that stay vegan rather than for health or the environment. You know, and, and I don't really care why somebody goes vegan, but you know, it's really important to start and end with any uh, social interaction about the animal suffering. Um, and um, so the deeper, some people advocate that you should do the door, foot in the door technique, like get people to give up chicken because chickens are the most abused animals on earth. And, uh, you know, at Vegan Arch, we don't have a stance against that, but our stance might, take a, might have a little bit more of an ask, is that we really want to educate people on what speciesism is and give people deeper philosophical underpinnings on the injustice uh, that is done to animals. And, and, you know, obviously the evolution of justice, um, you know, black people don't exist for white people, women don't exist for men, children don't exist for factory owners, you know, being a homosexual is not a mental illness. You know, the foray of uh, today is obviously that animals don't exist for humans to abuse and exploit. But, um, so we started to give millions of booklets about speciesism, and we find that our belief is that once it exists in people's minds, they know the word, it'll become an accepted form of prejudice, and then, uh, you know, social change will follow. Uh, any questions? No, well, uh, you know, uh, and if you have any questions or comments, feel free to raise your hand. Sometimes it's a... Uh... Please. Hey, yeah. So uh, you mentioned that you had done follow-up studies on, uh, on the effectiveness of your leafletting. Like, how, how did you actually do that? Like, did you get people to give you details or you, like, call them up four weeks later? Or, like, what's the... Uh, the last survey we did, uh, and I didn't design it, um, so I'm not... I don't know all the minutiae, unfortunately, but it's uh, people get a booklet and then there's a survey on the back and they would get a $5 a gift card to a Starbucks, like the coffee shop, if they answered the survey. And then a month later, they get more questions asking if they had changed their uh, meat consumption behaviors. And uh, we've got the results in now, but uh, unfortunately we didn't get as many responses as we wanted. So we're gonna do another round of surveys, but uh, it, it is something, there's been a little bit of a lack in uh, quantifiable information for leafleting and uh, you know, so there's gotta be more surveys done. We also, we also have a lot of anecdotal evidence where, you know, thousands of people will write into Vegan IRH or, you know, when you're out there leafleting, people will be like, oh, I got one of these eight years ago, my whole family's vegan now. Uh, so we, we have, a, you know, a lot of things to make us believe that this works very well. Anybody else? <laughs> no. uh, thank you so much. Um, so some of the best places to hand out booklets would be at co places where there's youth, concerts, and colleges. Uh, at a concert, you want to get people going on the way out. Um, at universities, it's a great place too because you can a lot of times have conversations with people. And um, real quick, there's videos about this online if it interests you. I know also uh, Jura Tzaliansen is going to do a lot more leafleting, and we're actually in discussions about doing a three-week leafleting tour, including all the schools in Stockholm in uh, later September. Uppsala, Malmö, Göteborg. So if you wanted to join at that, you know, I can get you your email. That would be great. Uh, unfortunately, that usually happens during the weekday. I know a lot of people work 9 to 5, but we find we can hand out the most leaflets in the shortest amount of time uh, when people go, in, go to school in the morning. Uh, there's a few little basic things if you leaflet at, at some of the events uh, around town. Um, some mistakes people make is that they make it a question. Would you like some information? Can I give you one of these? And uh, the take rate drops like a rock. You really want to make it a statement, you know, Yelp Ayurin, Yelp Yur, uh, help animals, help stop suffering. And uh, 
Most people, if they're, people are walking by here, they'll hand out the leaflet sideways and they'll have their arm bent and then they'll make it a question and they might be a little nervous because they're not used to doing it so they might be a little close to the body. So leafleting is a lot of tone and body language. You know, would you like to uh, take a leaflet? You know, have you, have you ever thought about this? Uh, the take rate's gonna be very low and uh, it's not gonna be fun for the person handing out the leaflets and it's not gonna save as many animals because not as many are going out. So when you leaflet, you wanna be very loose. Like if you go to a party, you know, you wanna take up space and be happy and be like, hey, what's going on? You know, hey, good morning, help stop animals and then hand it out in front of your body. It's kind of weird I don't have a leaflet. And, uh, I'm sorry? Do you want one? Oh, that'd be amazing. I feel more comfortable with the leaflet in my hand. Uh, thank you so much, you're the best. Vat for vegan, fantastic. Uh, so if you hand out a leaflet, uh, you wanna say like, hey, how are you, good morning, help stop suffering, a statement, not a question, in front of your body. And it's kinda awkward to lock your arm, but when you leaflet, you always wanna lock your arm. And some people, when they leaflet, they'll hand it to someone's face or their crotch, you kinda just wanna hand it out naturally. So as they walk by, they just have to open up their thumb. And uh, so just being friendly, you can be the catalyst of any social interaction. And it's actually kind of fun to experiment with. Because even like, you know, there's been times where cops are angry or something and I'm like super laid back and you find that the cops, you know, 90% of the time will, will come laid back to you. So if you're confident and engaging and you assume people will take it and friendly, it is surprising how high the take rate is. Even at Stereos, during the demo, it was like 65, 70% and usually it's a little lower on streets. So I was, I was impressed by uh, how high the take rate was. Uh, and then, you know, on some college campuses, it can go up to like 95% or higher. But um, the tactic, once again, just ad nauseum is uh, you want to give a greeting, extend the arm fully across your body, and then thank people once they take it. And the thanking is so important, not necessarily for the person that walked by, but if there's 10 more people coming, you want to keep the take rate going because there's kind of like a, a contagiousness to it. Just like if people aren't taking it, you know, if you're, if you're awkward, um, you know, the other people won't take it, but you know, if you're, you know, hey, what's going on, help stop suffering, and uh, you kind of want to lean a little bit too, um, people are more likely to take it, even if they're walking, you know, you kind of assume that they're gonna take it, and uh, then like, oh, thank you so much, have a wonderful day, you're the best, just something positive, then the next person's more likely to take it because they see that you had a good interaction. If for some reason there's 20 people coming and the person doesn't take it, another very effective thing is to give a thumbs up. And that's not for the person that walked by. That's just like a positive gesture. So the people that are watching with their eyes, they, they think maybe he already got one or like it's a friendly thing. So it really helps keep the take rate going. When you have like a lot of people coming in every way, in every angle, I get really confused. Like, what you <laughs> what's your advice there? Well, I think you have, to, you have to be like a little bit of a, it's like human Tetris. You know, you have to, and it's kind of, I, I mean, I make it a game. I mean, I've handed out, you know, my friends more than a million and a half leaflets. You know, we have a game with it. Uh, it's also good to keep track of how many you hand out, like kind of with the cube, because it uh, gives people, you know, something to keep track of. We also do that at the Vegan Arch website, if anybody's interested. Um, the more you move, the more people you'll get. When people start leafleting, you start to see that they have lead feet. You know, they're a little nervous, they like feel weird walking up to people, especially at cereals where this is so wide open. The best thing would be to cut people off at like the stairs where they're not so wide open because it's much harder once people are, you know, in open space. Uh, I did see something that was a little weird at the demo, but I didn't want to be too critical, is that... Uh, you may. Okay, thank you. At the Jurtsfabriken or whatever, that had 100 people there, it seemed like there was people walking to the side, and they, if the people were walking by the side here, they would have one person, one person, one person, one person. So the same person may have been asked four times, and it might be a little annoying to that person, but also other people may have come who hadn't gotten one, and then they see other people not taking it, and it would lower the take rate. So instead of having like, you know, one person here, one person here, one person here that they have to walk through, it would be much better to have four people side by side, so everybody walks by and gets offered at once, and then the people that are there, they don't have to walk up to anybody. And um, one of the most effective techniques for leafleting is what I like to call the gauntlet. And uh, would you be so kind as to join me? You seem like you have long arms, very, very exciting. Uh, okay. <laughs> so if, this, if there's a wide walkway here, no, right here, please. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, your name? Julia. Victor again, thank you. Um, if there's a wide walkway all the way here, and uh, I stand here, then you can see it's a pretty wide walkway. If you were by yourself, you'd have to walk and chase people, they could avoid you. But if it's just the two of us, we can just hang out, ask how the day was. They're either gonna walk right by me or right by her. We don't have to walk up to anybody, it's super easy. Uh, the one caveat would be that a lot of times if we're hanging out, people turn sideways, and then they start to hand out sideways, which is very bad. So even if you're at Syria's tour and people come in two directions, you kind of want to turn and face when somebody comes so they have to walk across your body, because once you hand it out sideways, they're already halfway past you. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah. 
Uh, and also, if people are coming behind us, we would turn 180 degrees to face them as well. If it's super busy, like on that pathway uh, above the Serial's tall area, we had two people back to back. So we gave out, I think, around uh, with the your about 2,500 leaflets in like three hours. So it actually went pretty quick. Thank you so much, Yulia. You're the best. Um, yeah, so 2,500 leaflets, you figure one out of 70, you want to be conservative, one out of 100. 25 people will have a major dietary change for the rest of their life. And that's kind of amazing because it is a big ask for a lot of people. And um, so basically, ultimately, you know, you could read every little label on everything you buy, you know, make everything organic at home and that would be wonderful. And you might talk to your mom or dad who doesn't really care about this issue for like six years and they're not changing. Or you could hit up the streets and get somebody to go vegan who is receptive and you know, triple, 10 times more animals will be saved because of your life because you just did two hours of, of, of activism. So uh, that's the beauty of uh, the social revolution aspect of it, that every time we do activism, we're exponentially increasing the amount of animals our own personal veganism saves. And of course, there is a, you know, there is like a ripple effect to activism. You know, if you do some activism, you create another activist, you get somebody to go vegan, they affect five other people. I mean, you might get that one Annoying vegan that'll prevent people from going vegan. <laughs> you know, I'm joking. I'm sure no one does. But uh, so that's the beauty I think in doing activism. And obviously, I mean, it's kind of obvious point. But like the animals can't save themselves. It's up to us to uh, hit the streets. And, and people, of course, are not going to get this message as, as much as they need to in church, school, at their job, on television. Um, so that's to me the beauty of activism. And hopefully, people feel good on the inside. That I, I mean, I know I did. That that every day you're doing something to. Uh, bring the world that much closer to justice and, and a vegan world. Um, and it's nice too sometimes to have more people with you because uh, when we were leafing here, like people had lots of questions and stuff. So it's good if you have two or more people so somebody can talk to the interested person, give them more res resources and whatnot. Any other, thank you, Ahmad. Any, any other comments or questions? Okay. Um, I did want to touch a little bit about how to speak to people one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, the rest of my personal journey was once I started volunteering for Vegan Outreach, uh, me and my friends, we jumped in a little car, which was a small car, and we had 20,000 leaflets in it, and we reached 100,000 people in uh, three weeks, getting people coming out of concerts. And then I realized, like, oh, this, this, you know, people had such good reception, so many people reading, I was like, this is something I want to do. So I volunteered with Vegan Outreach for six weeks, and uh, I handed out the most leaflets anyone ever had at a university, and for a month, so they gave me a job. And that was kind of like my first like gung-ho thing because I uh, handed out twice as many leaflets as anyone ever had in a three-month three month period uh, to college students. And uh, from there, I traveled to almost uh, 650 different universities, probably doing activism over 700 cities. Uh, but I didn't have an apartment. It was pretty much a 2,300-day road trip. And I'm still one of the vestiges of that. I'm still pretty casual because I'm so used to just living out of a bag. Um, but it was a remarkable adventure, and it's so nice to see, obviously, that uh, people are so much more receptive to the message today than they were uh, in the past. But, uh, you know, traveling to middle of nowhere, Wyoming, Arkansas, Canada, Mexico, India, um, you, you know, Scotland, England, and um, the very conservative areas, progressive areas, you know, I've heard pretty much any question anybody could ask probably 50 times. So, uh, I, you know, I don't have all the answers, obviously, no one does. But uh, there's some things over the, uh, over the course of talking to so many thousands of people one-on-one -on -one, that I found is helpful uh, when you interact with others about this message. So I wanted to share some of that with you and uh, hope, hopefully some of it will be of value to you. And obviously, you know, discard anything that may not be of value. But, uh, you know, just to get the gears turning. Approaching doing outreach, I think is very important to think that uh, when you talk to people about veganism is to realize that things are not static. Uh, I think it's very depressing when you see the, the billions of animals that are suffering in the world, you know, the, the oceans are going down the toilet, there's dead zones, you know, there's wars, you know, there's so much, there's so, there's so much to be upset about. But uh, in our own personal lives, things are always changing. Things are always in flux. You know, even the earth seems static, there's mantle, you know, we think we're on like a, a planet where, you know, we're, we don't get vertigo, but the earth is spinning like crazy and the solar system is spinning and then the galaxy is spinning and the universe expanding into nothing, there has to be something. There's millions of things flowing through our bodies. Uh, everything is in motion. Time is going by, we're either getting older, smarter, or, you know, better health, worse health, whatever. Uh, but as it relates to a human being, I don't know about you, but when I was 10 years old, you know, all I wanted to do was buy more Legos, and become an athlete and you know now that I'm in my 30s that I don't have the same priorities you know uh, 
activism is more important, you know, God forbid your parents die, or you get sick, or if you have a child, you know, your child becomes the center of the universe. The point basically is that uh, we're always evolving as individuals. And uh, society, of course, is always evolving as well. You know, women can go to school now, which would be a shock. You know, women wearing jeans would be a shock, you know, not too long ago. Um, you know, the DSM V4, the Psychological Journal had uh, homosexuality as a mental illness in the late 70s. So, uh, you know, we have a long way to go, but you can see that uh, justice evolves over the course of time as well as in our individual lives. So when you talk to people one-on-one, -on -one, it's very good in the back of your mind to realize that this person might be super resistant to veganism now, but they're on their own journey and they could come around. And you being friendly and informative could play an instrumental part in them finally making the connection. And uh, to do outreach, you almost have to have a faith in people that if they have a heart or a brain, they will eventually make the connections. Um, and if you, you know, if you assume that to people, I think it, it kind of helps you do outreach that way. Splitting, I like to start with what not to do. Because uh, I've seen a lot of people volunteer and they're so passionate about this issue that they like emotionally overwhelm other people. They'll be like, they're cutting, they're castrating the piglets, the chickens and beaks are being burned off, you know, there's dead stones in the ocean. Uh, they'll tell them like 30 facts and the people are like, whoa, 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 calm down. So when you give too much information, too fast, too passionately, sometimes it, uh, people will dismiss you and the information because it's too much for them to handle. Uh, particularly in your social circles, if you have repeated exposure to, you know, a parent, a coworker, a friend, uh, if you're going to see them repeatedly, you don't have to give them the you know 99 reasons to go vegan the first time you see them. Um, Just about that, if I may. Please. Uh, when I talked to friends uh, two years ago, one year ago, I I took them to a ca cafe, right, and I spoke to them like two to three hours. <laughs> <laughs> every animal industry, right, and showed them on videos what happens in every industry, but that wasn't effective. I, I saw their re reactions; they were sometimes crying and shit, but uh, after a while, they didn't want any contact with me. Were they shut out or they don't, you know, they don't want to be the mirror or like made to feel the bad person or what have you? Yeah, I mean, I, f I put so much pressure on them, right? And they felt like, I don't want to hang out with, I think they think like, I don't want to hang out with me because uh, I'm so annoying and there's pressure. I just talk about veganism, and animals. <laughs> animals. But I love, you, I love your passion and I think I'm the same way yeah. on some levels, but you know, over the course of time I learned that like, you know, just because just you want something really bad doesn't always, you know, like let's, I mean, even asking someone on a date, if you're just like, oh my God, we should get married, like, you know, it's like you would freak someone out, you know, so it's like we're asking people to make m major life changes. Uh, I'm kind of funny because I ever see dogs, I can't even get my dog to sit. So I'm like, how am I going to get someone to change their life, you know, uh, major life change for them? I realized that uh, I can't change other people, I can only like help them change kind of thing. So. Um, I learned over the course of time to ask like more Socratic questions and give people support. But as it relates to mistakes, don't overwhelm people. If you have a quick interaction with someone, even at a cube, if you tell them 12 facts, odds are they're not going to remember the 12 facts. But if you tell them two or three facts, odds are it's going to stick. You know, that uh, these animals are completely innocent, they've done nothing to deserve this, uh, the cruelty is unspeakable, and you know, veganism is healthier, and you know, the only thing, the thing, the number one thing, it's harder in, in your mind than it is in reality. You know, just three quick things to leave with. I mean, if you talk about a bunch of other things, so be it. But, you know, leave people with two or three main ideas. Um, two other mistakes I see people make a lot of times is that they try to outsmart people into veganism. It's beautiful that veganism is linked to intelligence. It's about making connections. You know, if it's wrong to hurt this dog, how can it be right to hurt these, you know, million pigs? Uh, there's nothing different between farm animals and, and uh, domestic animals. But... We all know many things are bad for us. We know that eating fast food is bad for us. We know snooze and smoking is bad for us. Unfortunately, you know, millions, it breaks my heart, especially when I see vegan activists smoking. Um, we know these things are bad for us, but we still do it. So an intellectual explanation of why it's not good can serve its purpose, but it's usually not the most effective thing to begin with. First thing you want people, you know, most people unfortunately don't think about animals or they see them as objects or, you know, they see a piece of a body that they're eating. They don't, you know, they don't make the connection to a sentient being. So I've found that people are infinitely more receptive and infinitely more likely to go vegan if they see the animal as an individual sentient being with a personality rather than just an object. So before all the rationalizing, you know, ask people like, you know, What's the difference between us and a cow? Like, do, you know, we both have ears, eyes, hearts, blood, 
you know, the, your dog is happy when you come home, it's scared when there's thunder, you know, do you think that animals feel pain? And then, you know, or just whatever it is, explain to people that uh, whatever you need to do, that the animal is a sentient being. They've done nothing to deserve being harmed. You know, if I take the testicles off of a human being or a pig, it's going to feel similar pain. Uh, it's not a, you know, animals are not a vegetable. The um, people need to feel for the suffering of the animals and the horror of their predicament. That they're born into pain, mutilation, isolation, and of course, an early and untimely death. Once people have, you know, excuse the expression, but humanize the animal, people's walls come down and they're like, yeah, this is, this is screwed up. Um, along that vein too, lost my train of thought. Hopefully it'll come back. Um, I just jumped out of my head, sorry. There's a few other things that you can do. Uh, well, one other mistake I see people do is that somebody went vegan for health, and then they'll talk to a thousand people about the health argument. You know, talk about the health argument, but realize that people are different. People have different interests when it comes to veganism. If they're super interested in the environmental angle, then talk about that for a little while. You know, talk about the ethical uh, version. Don't just be uh, single-minded. With, with the knowledge that anytime we have an interaction with someone, I think it's good to talk about animal suffering first and last, since that's the reason people stay vegan and whatnot. Um, people in Stockholm may be fairly progressive, but you know, in my average travels, I talk to a lot of people in very conservative hunting areas, very religious areas, where people, and can maybe like a little bit like your friends of mine, that, that they feel like defensive or like they're being attacked sometimes. So um, I found it super powerful. This was almost like a Jedi mind trick to talk about your own journey. Because your own journey doesn't make anybody feel bad and it doesn't put anybody on the defensive. And by hearing your journey, they can kind of follow your, your thinking and kind of hopefully help come to the same realizations without feeling like they're a horrible person. Um, and I think this is also instructive for like, if you have a boyfriend, girlfriend, um, they say like the, a lot of fights, they say like, you're bad or you, you did this or you made me feel that way. And they say you shouldn't make you statements, you should say I feel. Like, you know, I feel hurt when you did this because like your feelings can never be wrong. And I think it's very similar when you talk, uh, you know, I've given whole speeches in like middle of nowhere, Michigan, where I just talk about my own journey and people are hugging me and they're like, oh, it's so terrible, you know, I need to go vegan. And uh, that really surprised me because it, it, was, it was actually a talk where they told me I couldn't use the word vegan uh, a few years ago. So I just ended up talking about my own journey for half an hour. And I was really surprised at how many people came around to, uh, you know, hugging me and saying this is terrible. Uh, so that's when I first really realized that talk about your own journey is uh, super, super powerful. Um, like I had a friend that uh, was vegetarian, but they ate a lot of uh, dairy and cheese. So I kind of wanted to be like, you know, what the hell is wrong with you? You know, like it's horrible, like the suffering is out of control. But uh, I, I found I had more success with being like, oh yeah, you know, I was a pizzatarian. Um, I ate, I, yeah, it's kind of true, you know, I ate, uh, you know, I ate cheese for so many years because I never made the connection that animals are suffering or animals are dying from the cheese production. And then I'll go into like, you know, I never realized that, uh, you know, a woman only lactates when she's pregnant. The purpose of, uh, you know, dairy milk is to make a little baby cow explode into a big cow. Uh, you know, I never even realized that uh, they put so many hormones into the animals to make them produce so many, you know, 10 times more liters of milk. And uh, they could kind of follow that journey with me. And then would also relate, of course, um, oh, you know, there's pus in milk and, uh, you know, they put the udders on the teats and they pull so hard that over the course of time they become sores and they pull all the pus in there from the infections. And, you know, you sure, I realized it was homogenized and pasteurized, but that's a, uh, you know, sanitation process, not a removal process. And anyways, I go on for like a few minutes and it was really surprising that people were like, oh man, I never knew that either. Uh, and that, you know, obviously that's a lot more effective than being like, the hell's wrong with you for, for, uh, for having dairy. So uh, talk more about your own journey, be very powerful. And uh, probably the number one thing in any social interaction with other people, which is like another like insane to me Jedi mind trick is show people you care about them. Even if you're talking about veganism, you can, you can stop to ask like, oh, what, what do you study at the school? What's your name? You know, like, where did you grow up? Um, 
Because some people think that, you know, we're fundamentalist animal savers, and yes, you know, we're here to save the animals, but the people have to see that it's a, a it's a profoundly human issue, and it's, there's a social revolution. You know, people have to see that we care about them. Like, hey, your dad might not get a heart attack. You know, you'd probably be healthier. You'll feel good being ethical. You know, I care about your well-being as much as about this issue. And uh, even very conservative people, I've shake their hands, be like, even people have been aggressive towards me. I'm like, oh, what's your name? You know, what do you study here? And, you know, later on, they apologize to me for being rude. Uh, so just always showing people that you care about them. And this is very good for when you talk about family members, because for whatever reason, family members are weird. They like feel it's like a power dynamic to be like, hey, mom, you know, I love you. I don't want you to get a heart, heart disease. Thank you so much. Um, you know, that it's not just about like, hey, you know, save these animals. I want you to be healthy. Um, and along that vein, too, a lot of people have no idea about the health benefits because, you know, it's not on television. So uh, explain to people, hey, one out of two people in the West will die of heart disease. It's a completely chosen illness, you know, high blood pressure. And I don't know if I want to, I don't want to bore you with uh, all, these, all these examples, but some of my favorite examples are even just like, you know, uh, being mindful to ask Socratic questions, making questions instead of statements so they think and they, you know, connect themselves. You know, sometimes I ask people, you know, you know what happens to a lion if I feed him meat three times a day for 10 years, what happens to his arteries? 85% of people would be like, oh, well, they, they harden, they get stiffer. And I would, well, actually, no, that, I thought the same thing, but that's what happens to a human arteries. Uh, lions are made by nature to eat meat, and if you feed them meat all the time, their, their arteries are perfectly normal, limber, blood flows perfectly. However, in a human, human artery, you feed meat, dairy, eggs, and cheese, your arteries are gonna harden, uh, plaque's gonna build up, your blood flow is gonna be restricted, higher blood flow is gonna lead to inflammation, inflammation is a precursor for cancer, even aneurysms and blood clots you know, in the brain, that's, you know, it's like a heart attack of the brain, and uh, I mean, it's just shocking how people that weren't even receptive, they're just like the walls, like, like the Berlin Wall coming down, like they just like hear what you have to say. And uh, it's also good sometimes to switch. If they're not interested in animal suffering, some people don't care. Uh, unfortunately, I, in my experience, like religious people, you know, shift it to the health. Um, there's so many different ways to talk about veganism. We don't have to be a myopic or singular. And uh, so explaining the health benefits, I really love the Gary Yavrovsky. Have you seen that, the best speech ever? Yeah. Uh, I really, because I also, I thought that like, okay, I love animals, I'm not gonna eat them, but you know, we're made by nature to eat meats. So I really love it when he talks about the jaw. Uh, you know, we're, we have the jaw like a herbivore, the digestive enzymes, the intestines, we don't have claws, we don't have carnivorous instinct. So uh, just people are shocked when they hear that because it's just like something that they've never thought about. So, uh, and once the wall starts to come down a little bit, you know, then, then you kind of have them. Um, I, I think it's uh, important to be mindful of language. Nobody in this room probably says it, but you know, so many people instead of calling he or she for an animal will say it, and that kind of reinforces the, uh, that animals are objects. So it's, uh, it's good to say that. Just like you know, people say harvest, we harvest this animal. It's kind of like Orwellian, you know, horrific Nazi-esque, you know, whatever. It really is disgusting. You know, you're not harvesting animals. Um, another thing one-on-one -on -one with people is uh, I like to do what I call the 10-90 rule, where I agree with people 10% to get them to agree with me 90%. Uh, a lot of times I've spoken to hunters and they'll be like, you know, why are you telling me how to live my life? And they're not really receptive. And I'll be like, well, you know what? You'd be surprised by like, I think hunting is awesome. Like it's so much better than factory farming. And they'll be like, it kind of like throws them off their thing that I'm like supporting hunting. And I, I hate hunting personally, but I'm like, I do think that there is less hunting. I'm not, you know, we're not fundamentalists. There is less suffering in one day of being shot, as bad as that is, versus a lifetime of being mutilated, confined, you know, yada, yada, yada. So uh, what I would agree with him that, it was funny after, you know, after like five or 10 minutes talking, he's like, oh, you know, I really enjoy speaking to you. Like, I completely agree. Like factory farming is such a horror. You know, we need to stop it. So uh, don't be afraid to agree with people. Like, you know, it's not about a fundamentalism, but about making a human connection. You know, as much as I, you know, I kind of wish everybody was vegan yesterday and, you know, of a more abolitionist nature. Um, this goes back to what we talked about in the beginning, that everybody's on their own path. You know, even, even, you know, when people even cut down, I wish that they were going vegan, but, it, you know, it's good to show excitement to our friends and family. Like, oh, mom, I can't, you know, it's so great that you got the, the veggie burger instead of the fish. Like, you know, I love you. I think it's so great that you're open-minded and, you know, I'm so glad that you're healthier. You know, to be excited about people's small changes as we, you know, gently push them along the way. Because... Uh, Ultimately, they have to do it themselves. Any questions or comments? Uh, too much info? <laughs> so, yeah. Okay. Um,
you know, so this endless ways to talk about veganism. Um, somebody's like a hardcore feminist, you can kind of like nicely call them out, like do you know what they do to dairy cows? You know, do you know about rape racks, artificial insemination? Just get people's gears turning, ask questions. Um, for some of the religious folk too, which is a, probably for me the hardest demographic, uh, if they don't care about animals, then that's fine. Talk about the environment, you know, leaving the, the earth clean for their children. Uh, the Garden of Eden was vegan. Uh, the body's the temple. You can be more of service if you're healthy. You, you know, you're going to live longer, most likely have a lower incidence of disease with all these, these things. You know, did you know that every 13 seconds a child dies of hunger? And if it's taken us 12 to 16 uh, kilograms of grain to just one pound of beef, that means that we could feed everybody twice over, but we choose not to. You know, on one acre, on one uh, acre of land, I think they can grow uh, 250,000 um, pounds of uh, potatoes, 50,000 pounds of tomatoes, or 250 pounds of beef with, with the grain there. So uh, even if you don't care about the suffering of an animal, you know, uh, God put us here for us to use animals. Uh, consider these children, every 13 seconds a child dies of hunger. And every child that dies of hunger is a murdered child if we could feed them and we couldn't. And you know, they're a child of God as much as you and I. So, you know, no matter where people are coming from, you know, you can talk their language a little bit and hopefully once you talk their language a little bit, mirror wherever they're coming from, they'll be open to the other, uh, the other arguments you have to say. Um, May I ask, do you know any or many like, religious activists? Yes, uh, vegan arts, we have people who are um, like super Christian, who, who work in the South. I mean, we don't necessarily, our leaflets are not, are secular, but uh, there's also the, in the United States, there's a Christian Vegetarian Association that puts out a lot of information, the, the Jewish Vegetarian Association. Um, so there is more like uh, towards, geared towards certain demographics. I can add in about Sweden. Do you know, we, we have a... Uh, organization called Bildt Ostland, Christian Vegetarian uh, which is uh, yeah, Christians that care about veganism. So, so maybe you can point in that direction and see, yeah, you're a Christian and I can recommend this organization for you. They have lots of good what website. And, sorry? What about Muslims? Muslims? I don't know any organization in Sweden for Muslim vegetarians. Well, so, some good things to be mentioned because uh, you know some demographics are more entrenched is to be like there's nothing in the Bible or the Quran or the Talmud against being vegetarian, and that uh, you know if we can live without producing suffering, why not? Because a lot of times people would be like this is halal or this is a uh, uh, what's it called in the, the Jewish tradition. This is kosher, you know, people have no idea the horrors that these animals go through. So either to explain that or just be like, you know, this, you know, you can, you know, be as Jewish as you want. No, 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 no. no go ahead, please. <laughs> yeah, I, I, will, I will, I usually say to Christians or Muslims or Jewish, um, that what would God prefer? You, God has given you the choice, right, to eat meat or vegetables or vegan. I, I, what do you think he would prefer? You killing animals or eating a, a vegan burger or whatever. That's brilliant. And, and also in persuasion, uh, not just with veganism, but in general in your lives, or sales, they always say that if you give people two options, and one is kind of like the lesser of the two options, even if they will, don't want option number two, most people gravitate towards option number two if they don't like option number one, if, they just get, if, you, if you portray it as like a choice between two. You know, like what do you want? You want to die and not see your kids, or do you want to like make these small changes and live longer, and you know, learn to love vegetarian food? You know, I mean, I wouldn't be so hard-edged, but you know, you get the point. Uh, and talking about my own personal journey, a lot of times also I forgot to mention, uh, a lot of people see veganism as a lack, as a taking away, as like they equate it to animal suffering because that's all they hear. So I think it's very important to tell people like the veganism, yes, the animals are suffering and we're trying to address it, but you know, veganism is not just like, oh, we're going to take away, you can't eat all your favorite foods. It's really like an ever-growing expansion into all the different foods you can try, ethnic, quinoa, almond milk, whatever, all these delicious new burgers, that it's not a lack and also it's actually an inclusion of more into your rubric of who matters. You know, who you care about doesn't just have to be your dog and your wife or your husband. You know, it can be all the people, you know, there's no limit to who you can love and whose pain you can consider. And wouldn't it be better to consider the pain of all instead of just the pain, the pain of few? Like, why only care about dolphins and dogs? Why not care about all animals? Uh, so that's some, some good questions to ask people um, that, I, that I've found have loosened them up. When you leaflet to, 
you got to meet a few, you know, you might meet a few jerks. And a lot of people, the first time they leaflet, they're very sensitive. And they're very just, you know, they're shy, they're, you know, nervous, it's the first time doing it. If you lead people into leafleting, it's very important to explain why we leaflet. Nietzsche says people who have a why can bear any how. So it's really important to explain that, like, you might just see these giving people paper and there might, you know, you might see four in the trash, which looks horrible if you've handed out like 600, you know, it just visually looks horrific to some volunteers. But, you know, explain to people that, okay, we most likely saved, you know, over the course of the next 50 years, 6,000 animals from us being out here. People need to know why they're out there on the streets. And when you're leafleting, is not the best time to be sensitive. Um, you know, if, if, if we ended up saving 6,000 animals that day and two people said, I love eating meat or look how delicious they are, who cares? And uh, a lot of volunteers will be, uh, if somebody says something rude, which is very, very, very rare, I find that like, the fear of people being rude in public is so far less than, is so far greater than the reality. But if you're like a leader with other people, uh, activists or at the cubes, I find that like once they leave, I just like make fun of them a little bit. Not, you know, just I, like, I don't care. Like, okay, well that guy's an idiot. You know, like just, just to like to diffuse the, the hurt feelings of the volunteer. Um, so yeah, leafing is not a good point to be sensitive. We're doing so much good, you know. If you could save 6,000 animals and two people were jerks, like who cares? It's almost like you got a jerk quota. Just let it fall off your back, move on to the next person. Uh, there is no denying, though, that uh, if you do talk to the public long enough, you know, every now and then you get that person that's just like so dumb, you can't help but think like, really, you know, you're the sperm that won. Uh, so, uh, you know, you can't help but think that. That's okay. Be kind and polite, and just at a minimum, he sees that like the vegan I spoke to was super nice, and then you know we can let that person go, and we'll get him, you know, later down the road, and. Uh, I don't think it's good to waste our time with debaters when in the public. There's this like intellectual element, especially in the United States, where we're taught in school to just like criticize and undermine and point out what's wrong with everything. I've spoken to some people where like you tell them 10 things and they'll boom, knock down whatever you say. So I kind of try to do a little Jedi mind trick on them too and I'll ask them, people really go nuts, like they really don't know what to say sometimes. I'll be like, well, okay, well you said 10 things that are bad about veganism, can you tell me something that's good about veganism? And like their whole brain and mind is just like focused on tearing down that they don't even know what to say sometimes. Uh, but it, but it, you know, just shifting their, their mind, so that's powerful. That being said, outreach is a numbers game. We're not gonna get everybody to go vegan, but like it still is incredible that we're gonna get, you know, 15, 20 people every day. So focus on the good that we're doing and the people we're changing. Uh, the people that are rude or not receptive, those are the ones that hurt more. But it's, I think it's not intelligent to focus on the, uh, the non-receptive people, particularly other volunteers that this may be new to them. Um, another question, sometimes when you do outreach or you talk to your friends and family, you get these fantastic questions. Uh, you know, one I remember was somebody was like, Vic, I got a scenario for you. What if you were on an airplane? and you're going to your grandma's 90th birthday party and you said you would do anything to be there and the plane crashed in the Pacific Ocean. If you were on this teeny little island, would you eat an insect? Got you, you know, to survive and be there. I'm like, yes, I probably would eat an insect, but the, you know, the real question is, what if you lived in Stockholm and you could go anywhere, you can go to freaking Max and there's five fucking vegan burgers, would you still choose to torture an innocent being? So when people ask you these fantastic questions, it's really good to steer them back to the main idea, because uh, the fantastic questions, well, I'm sure you've already heard them and they'll always be there. Ask them if they would eat a human, then they would say yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, they, they Chewy. Tastes like chicken. Yeah, you know, that's a good question, too. Uh, by the way, you know, anecdotally, if we're hanging out here, have you ever read that book Alive about the rugby team that? Uh, Crash in the Andes, and they made a movie out of it. That's my favorite book of all time. And you're like, you're like, one page you're crying, the other page you're dying of laughter. Anyway, it's, it's like a real quick read if you uh, if you like to read. I highly recommend. Um, you know, doing activism for all these years, uh, seeing some people get burned out, and uh, people ask me like, do you get burned out? I'm like, no, nah, not really, because I see veganism not just as you know doom and gloom, but we like to have a lot of fun. I think that like enjoying life and laughing doesn't take away from the work at hand, because uh, as, as horrible as it is for the animals, like life is still beautiful and wonderful. So I encourage people to, uh, you know, there's so many instances, uh, reasons to be happy, even when there's reasons to be sad, and um, I think it's very important when you do outreach not to get too cynical. You know, if your intelligence, int the intelligence is linked to depression too, because you're more aware of what's really going on. You know, we all know we're going to die. You know, there's like a lot of depressing stuff going on out there. Uh, we're going to get diseases. People we care about are going to be hurt. You know, it's like uh, the animal holocaust so it never stops. Uh, you know, we can feel like a, a mouse fighting, like a herd of gorillas. So um, it is really good to focus on the victories, on the people we're reaching, on how like society is changing. The more vegan options, think of the positive things. Um, but I think it's instructive to think about what is cynicism. Cynicism is an emotional defense mechanism where you assume the worst of everyone and everything so you can't be hurt. 
and that might prevent you from being hurt, but that is also like a really crappy way to go through life, and it's a horrible way to do outreach, because we have to believe that people, if they have a harder brain and they learn enough, that they're gonna change. Um, so the animals don't need our cynicism, they don't need our emotional weakness, they need our passion, our strength, our conviction, our never say die attitude. So I think that's really important when you do outreach. And um, never forget that they're infinite sources of inspiration. Uh, I used to leaflet in Arkansas. One out of every two people in Jonesboro, Arkansas, I swear to you, had camouflage on, going into university. Never seen anything so weird in my life. I was out there talking for eight hours, handing out leaflets. One person was like half a vegetarian. And I felt, at first I felt kind of weird. And like people looked at me like I had three heads, like I was like a Jehovah's Witness in some progressive area. Like it really, on some levels it wasn't a nice feeling in 2008. But then I reminded myself, like I may physically be alone at this university, but am I really alone? Not so much. I got billions of animals in a cage. You know, Vic, keep going, keep fighting, you know, say your piece. Uh, there's millions of activists all around the world. And um, being fortunate enough to travel some, it's crazy to realize that, you know, we're part of something so much bigger. This is like the forefront of justice, helping, uh, helping uh, ameliorate the, the planetary suffering. And even if you talk to just your friend, you know, there's millions of people all over Mexico, India, Philippines, China. There's this whole groundswell of grassroots movements, you know, making films, talking about these issues. So never feel alone uh, when you talk about these issues. And you can almost even have a degree of certitude that, like, this is what everybody's doing, you know, like, come aboard. And uh, I try not to be a jerk to people, but it is interesting to note, too, that uh, uh, psychological surveys reveal that the number one reason people apparently apparently change their social behavior is because it's not socially acceptable. So I try not to be a jerk, but in my social circles, uh, you know, I don't think it's such a horrible thing to just plant little seeds here and there like, uh, you know, I don't, I don't think I could ever date some, you know, you seem like a nice person, but I, I don't know, I don't know if I could ever date someone who, you know, actively supports kill, hurting animals. And you know, it, I think it's not what you say, it's how you say it. So maybe I wouldn't say something so strong, but just kind of like, help allude to the fact that like, this is, this is in the past, you know, this is something we don't want to support. This is something that, you know, is not acceptable. Uh, so I, th I think it's important to, in a nice way, convey that to people. Um, but I was super inspired, legitimately, being here in Sweden. I got to hang out with Daniel, and he's kind of like from uh, Europe, Italian, and he's kind of a humble guy. So I didn't know all the crazy stuff he had done. I don't know if he ever told you the story about how he, uh, they were going to kill the chimpanzees after the experiments at the Karolinsky Institute. So he got his mom, who was a school teacher, to have like 200 kids or something, right? Like, let them live. And like, he had the media, and a lot of people came out to the demo. So he saved these three chimpanzees, and they went to a sanctuary in uh, the UK, and he, like, it really means a lot to him. And uh, he went there and he started to say hello to them in Swedish. And apparently, like, the vivis sectors must have spoken Swedish, so it, like, triggered something in the monkey. So as soon as he goes to see these animals that he saved and, like, he's their hero, they start throwing shit at him, you know, because, <laughs> like, you know, they hear the Swedish. Uh, but I thought that was so inspiring. Or all these investigations. I got to stay with uh, this woman, Celia, in uh, Oslo. She had done over 100 investigations. You know, they had all this, like, money, uh, all these trials, all this stress. And, but, you know, because of her and so many other people, I mean, uh, Norway Parliament, of course, banned... Uh, the, the production of fur. So um, never feel alone out there doing route reach and never, uh, you know, never forget all the sources of inspiration, especially if you're like a little depleted. You know, seeing, uh, seeing how Ahmad runs the cube, I was like, this is awesome. This is a military operation. He's like, you know, you got 25 minutes in here. Here's the thing. You know, like it was, it was beautiful to see. And um, so, you know, spend some time doing activism to recharge your batteries, to think of all the, the things that inspire you. Um, Another story I told the other day, it's kind of long, but uh, did you ever hear about the Cuban Revolution? I just think it's like the most amazing thing ever. These like 86 idiots hop into like a leaky boat. They, they don't even make it to land. All these people are searching for them in professional army. Um, they have to wade through the water. They get, as soon as they finally reach land after three and a half days, they've all been seasick. It's like this horrible, horrible situation. They get ambushed by 1,200 professional soldiers. Everybody gets shot to pieces. There's only 12 that survive. Of the 12 that survive, four of them say, F this, I'm not, I'm not dying. You know, I got a second chance at life. Um, Fidel Castro, Raul Castro, Che Guevara, among the three that live. You know, two and a half years later, whatever it is, they defeat this 20,000 20, force of professional army. They overtake the whole island. They start, instead of having hundreds of millions of dollars going to like these rich corporations of foreign countries, they're building hospitals, roads. And you know, there was, it was not a perfect revolution necessarily, but uh, it's just so inspiring that like never give up, never, uh, you know, people said, uh, you know, Britain was the most powerful military in the world. This is little guy in a loincloth saying, like, you know, 
we're going to stop you. And of course, you know, the, the protest, the nonviolence, the, the spinning your own cloth, the salt march, you know, they had to tuck their tail and get the hell out of India. So um, whether it's big or small, there's, there's infinite sources of inspiration. So, you know, try to remember that if you feel discouraged. And if you, uh, if you want a career in the animal rights movement, I think it's so beautiful that you volunteer. Um, handing out leaflets is one way to exponentially increase how many animals you're saving with your own life. Some other ways would be either to work in an animal rights organization. It's not always like the most paying job in money, but in my personal example, I didn't get paid much for the first six, seven years and you know, still less in the corporate sector. But you know, if you factor in, you define it for yourself, you, know, you paid it in uh, adventure, purpose, meeting wonderful people, uh, doing something you're really passionate about, uh, you know, maybe you're overpaid on some levels. Um, and, and now in the animal rights movement, at least in the States, there's been a big push to try to make these jobs sustainable. You know, you shouldn't feel guilty if you go to the movies or out to eat once a week. Uh, you know, it's a marathon, not a sprint. And whether it's even volunteering, you know, if you can't go to every cube, then, you know, go to as many as you can. But, it's, you know, if you, um, you know, we're in it for the long haul until we have animal liberation. It's not, you know, you don't want to just be a flash in the pan for six months. Um, and if you are intelligent and highly paid and luck fortunate people in the world, you know, I always think it's weird that I'm, I was born in Sweden, even though I'm a fake Swede. I don't speak Swedish, unfortunately. Or, uh, but, uh, you know, why, what did I, I didn't do anything to deserve being born in the first world in a time of peace to like a kind family. Just like these animals did nothing wrong to be born into their, their horrible suffering that they endure. So if you have this realization, if you, you know, either do activism, volunteer, you know, if you, if you work for an organization, we really need our best and brightest in this movement full time. If there's something you're, you're, if there's something you're interested in, I would love to talk to you or try to provide resources or put you in touch with whoever. Um, and lastly, if you make a lot of money, obviously, you can pay for other people to do activism full time. So uh, in Sweden, it doesn't seem to be as strong a culture of donating, but I know a lot of groups like uh, Jurijets Allianz and they could really use more financial support. You know, the work they do is tremendous. So uh, if you make a little bit of money, you know, consider um, donating more to them. And um, one last thing I wanted to mention that I forgot. When I talk to people, the number one analogy I use for people and the thinking behind it is to transfer people's love of domestic animals onto farm animals is what I like to call the dog pig analogy. So if I'm at Serial Story or something, I'll say like, you know, what if I had a dog, a baby dog in my hand, a baby pit bull? What if I pulled his teeth out with pliers here in front of everybody and then ripped his testicles off with no anesthesia and then cut his tail off while he's screaming bloody murder? What if I took this little guy and then I put him in a box and he can't even turn around? You know, would people in Serio Star, would they try to stop me? Uh, you know, would they think that that's perfectly fine? Uh, would they call the police? You know, do you think I would go to prison for felony animal cruelty? You know, something along that nature. Well, and they're like, they're, they're, bless you. Uh, or may the universe be with you. Or the, uh, I'm sorry, I'm not very religious, personally, but uh, the, uh, the question really becomes, you know, they're going to follow you with like the abuse of the dog. And then you do the little shift. Now what if you're eating ham and bacon? That's word for word what they do to those poor animals. And you know, what really is the difference between this one dog or millions of uh, pigs, you know, have hearts, eyes. And I find that for whatever reason, that particular analogy and that's those Socratic questions really starts a conversation and gets people to like instantaneously make the connection between, you know, that, that, that dichotomy between farm animals and domestic animals. So I just wanted to share that because I forgot to mention it earlier. How do you um, answer the kids' question, like in a, you know, informative, but... Uh, Children? Yeah. Well, that's a very interesting thing because I used to feel weird show because our booklets used to be a little bit more graphic. Mm -hmm. And um, I used to feel weird showing it to kids that were like under like maybe 14. But uh, our founder, I really love him. He's, uh, he said, uh, old enough to eat him, old enough to know. So uh, he gives it to like six-year-olds and everybody. Uh, you, you know, but I, I think, you know, clearly uh, doing outreach is all about psychology and communication. So we tailor our message to who we speak to. And um, to children, of course, we may not have to talk about the worst of the realities. But, you know, you can't ask to, you know, let them know that, you know, these animals that we're eating is just the same as, you know, the dog that you're petting. And, mm -hmm. and that's why I don't eat animals. And that's why millions of people don't eat animals. Um, you I'm know, just be a little more gentle. And I try to inform the children what they, mm -hmm. if they, especially if, if they throw some meat away, like, that's actually a person, you know. But uh, it's also sometimes in, it feels wrong in a way because they can't make the choice at home. Mm -hmm. They like have to eat what the parents serve. That's very, it's, yeah, it's very difficult. A little bit stiff, 
it's not so easy sometimes. Well, that's awesome that you do that, and I'm sure these students are lucky to have you. Yeah. Um, this is woman Lorena Muke. From, uh, she lives in Atlanta. She's the director of the Ethical Choices Program. She's this amazing woman because she lives in like a more conservative state of Georgia. Excuse me. She gives 500 presentations to uh, humane education presentations to middle schoolers each year. So um, I'm sure that if we like looked at what she does, she like tones down the message a little bit, but but still reaches uh, reaches to people. But I think even just planting that seed to get people to ask questions is uh, is so huge. And uh, do you mind if I tell one quick little inspiration story? Um, there's a girl that leafed with me who's, uh, she's a granddaughter of uh, Cesar Chavez, who's like a workers' rights activist, who's vegan, like, a lo you know, before it was cool. And she's, di she's like this tall, and she hands out leafed with me, and she's adorable. And uh, her mom sent her to, to, to her first grade school, and she had like a love animals, don't eat them shirt. And so after she comes home, her mom's like, did the kids make fun of you? She's like, yeah, they did. They're like, well, what did they do? She's like, oh, well, they put salami on my face and threw ham in my nose. And, and her mom's like, did you cry? She's like, yeah, I cried. And her mom's like, well, why'd you cry? Because they were making fun of me. She's like, oh, no. I cried because they didn't realize they were hurting animals. You know? So I just thought it was so inspiring that if a child who's like six and a half years could know that, you know, uh, I don't have to take it personally, you know, what people say and do. But um, even with children, I think it kind of comes back to me for it's not what you say, it's how you say it. And you know, if you overwhelm people, if you accuse people of being horrible people or or if you, you know, say, like, oh, yeah, I, I ate animals. Uh, uh, once I was in Ohio at one of these 4-H, um, which is like the major propaganda Orwell horror thing, they like, they have little children in the farm country, they raise their own cow, and then they slaughter it, just so they like, kind of get over it, that they're like, oh, this is what happens, you know? So uh, this, this girl, she was petting the cow, and like, do you, do you love your cow? And she's like, yeah, I love my cow. She's like, oh, yeah, I love cows too, that's why I don't eat them. And you saw her eyes just like, pop up like uh, it was it was amazing to see her like make the connection right in front of me so just uh you know sharing a little bit of your story you know maybe to the kids that you know i love i'm i'm, I'm a, i love animals that's why i keep trying you know new delicious food or you know what have you and also ask the kids to speak with one of their vegan friends or one of uh, one one of uh, a person in the school who is vegan and because every vegan is very happy to have someone come to them Say, hey, I want to go vegan. The vegan will help you so much. That's a great. That's a great point. Instead of saying like, go to vegan challenge twenty two or yeah. whatever, yeah, I think like uh, people under like twelve years old, I don't think it's so useful for them. So like, tell them, speak with your vegan friend. They will be happy to give you information. Like, how do you, how do you, how do you do it and stuff? Yeah, and that's to me that also comes back to people don't have the knowledge. Like, I think it's so great to introduce people to food because they have that. Uh, what's it called, the misconception that it's like cardboard and broccoli, you know. That's why I'm really excited for like when the Beyond Burger comes here because I like love the he heck out of that thing and, uh, you know, just keep chipping away. And, and um, I was really surprised because I was such a shy, weird kid with no friends, you know, couldn't get a date for so long, all this stuff. It's kind of depressing, but <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm surprised that like thousands of people I know or you know, hundreds of people in my social circle have gone vegan and it just boggles my mind that I think that when I first got into this, I didn't realize like the power of my own voice and so I, I, when I talk to uh, activists, I really like to remind people that like, never underestimate the power of your own voice. Or uh, you know, if you speak with sincerity and kindness, like people will change. Uh, and, and I've seen so many people go vegan that were like the biggest jerks. Like I feel like our job is like a little zen in a way, like not to, I'm not really worried about what people do. I just want to do everything I can to help them make the connection. Uh, two quick examples were I had a friend, Anthony, who's like a big Italian, you know, meat, cheese, everything. When I first started ordering burritos without uh, cheese or sour cream, he made fun of me. He thought I was an idiot. He's like, it's a personal choice. Like, why, you know, I don't want to hear this. Little by little, I showed him like a video. We talked about the environment. You know, I wouldn't talk to him for three weeks, show him something else. He's now more vegan than I am, which is like shocking because he's like mega vegan, you know, ninth level vegan. So uh, I've seen so many people change that initially uh, you wouldn't assume them to change. So, you know, you can't give up on other people. You can't give up on yourself. Um, I had a friend, Phil, who joined me for almost two years on the road. He now did this thing called like the Vegan Bros, uh, where they kind of do like this like edgy mainstream thing to try to push veganism. It's a hair controversial. But um, his father was in a religious cult, and he'll say so himself. And for every time we stayed at his house for years, his dad would like have a conniption and just like talk about how stupid being vegan is. Of course, he's been vegan for five years now and like promotes it to his, to his friends. So um, that's inspiring to me too, that you know, anybody's capable of change when they uh, make the connection. Martin? Um, I facilitated a workshop on how to 
uh, talked to me leaders and then we went out uh, and uh, tried but they only had the leaflets and uh, were yeah going to try and, and some of them had experience from a cube and they said oh it's so much easier with the video because then you can show them you can I don't have to talk so much I can just show them so I was wondering if you have any experience of of, um, of comparing showing a video and I know leaflets about the oh, yeah, well from a, from an efficacy standpoint clearly there's differences uh, you know the virtual reality we get people crying all the time and mm. I don't know if we mentioned this before but like you know crying is not usually a good thing but it always brings joy to my soul to see a because you know, people are like making the connections when they cry. So virtual reality hits people on a much deeper level than handing out a booklet. Um, the down, the down side of, of virtual reality is that you know you might be able to reach 50 people, and you know you have to get permission. You know, leafleting you can hand out thousands of leaflets. You, know, you usually don't need permission. It's much easier to do. Um, so I think they're both great to do, and one has greater impact. But you know, so. Per person that watches the video, the impact is greater for the virtual reality, clearly. But for the amount of time you spend, you know, you could make an argument that a lot of places handing out leaflets will save more animals. But uh, to me, I don't think there's necessarily one's better than the other. They're like, you know, two amazing things to do. Um, we need both. Yeah, just like you know, Cube's phenomenal thing to do, and, and uh, you, you probably everybody, everybody knows uh, the Cube's in town. But uh, if you haven't been, highly recommend that you go check it out. And um, what were we saying about... Um, and there hasn't been studies comparing you know, those, uh, what do you know? Uh, the, not, no, not that I know of. Um, no. Simon? So you touched upon this before, but uh, the uh, risk of relapse. Is there, what would you say is the most uh, effective way of sort of reducing the risk of that? Uh, like in the content of the leaflet or? Well, one thing I think is very instructive is that uh, people see it as a black and white. And I wish everybody was vegan yesterday, but in the United States, for example, 35% of people are eating less meat. And they're actually driving the, the market change more than you know the 2-3% of people that are vegan. Once you have people eating more vegan foods, there's a greater demand, so then there's more vegan products, and then there's more people, it's easier to go vegan, so it becomes kind of a positive feedback loop. So at Vegan Irish, we take kind of a, a, le, a softer stance, like some people are just like, I love cheese, I could never give up cheese. Well, you know, if you're if you're going to eat animals all day long because of this stupid little cheese thing, then you know what? Then start by eating cheese and not eating animals. Like, don't use that as an excuse to, to do anything. Sometimes I've actually heard people tell me, like, you know, my grandma makes meatloaf, and my grandma would be so upset. You know, I can't go vegan because then I couldn't have my mangroves. I'm like, okay, well, you know, I wish, you know, then go vegan 364 days out of the week, uh, the year instead of 365. So, uh, you know, there's no. Everybody's different, so there's no huge answer. But I think the greater the knowledge, the greater the experience, the longer people stay vegan. People are going to stay vegan longer if it's for animal rights, if it's for ethics. Uh, you know, I almost look at it as a greater education is deeper roots. You know, and uh, this is not something we do for ourselves. Yes, it's great for health and the environment. It's something we do for the animals. It's something we do because it's the right thing to do. So that's why uh, I think it's, the more you can tell people about the ethics of it, um, the deeper the roots will be. And um, also encourage people that if they stopped eating meat, that uh, you know they have a greater foundation of this issue than most people that do eat meat. And you know you can you know I'm not gonna exile you, but you know invite you to come hang out and, and eat vegan food and uh, you know ask you why. A lot of people that go uh, back to eating meat, I kind of like want to call bullshit because they're like you know oh I was weak, I had anemia, uh, you know I was like you know I had to crawl to the bathroom, you know I was lightheaded. The, uh, so you know. Every human body is different, and there may be some diseases where like, you would have to eat meat, which is great that there's going to be cultured meat in time, but most nutrients you can completely get on a vegan diet. So sometimes people eat like fast food all day long, and then they go on a healthy vegan diet, and they're like, I didn't feel so good. Well, maybe your body's adjusting. You know, give it a little more time. With people staying vegan, too, I think it's very instructive that, that we kind of want to see everybody, at least I do, want to see everybody be vegan immediately. But I've noticed doing outreach that for a lot of people, it doesn't happen right away. The people that see earthlings or th get a leaf foot and they've been vegan, you know, they throw, I've had people throw out their, uh, their eggs in front of me. I love those people. But for a lot of people, change is a slower process. If you have friends that diet, they're, they, you know, they're on 18 freaking diets, you know. It's like, you know, six weeks on, two weeks off. It's much healthier to 
make small changes in your diet to lose weight. And likewise, veganism, uh, most people that change slower, it tends to have deeper roots and be more lasting. Uh, and, and along how people see veganism as a lack sometimes, just encourage people to try more foods. If you go out to eat, if you go out to Max, get the veggie burger. You know, if you, uh, have you ever had quinoa before? Do you ever eat Indian food? You know, include people to add more in the amount of foods that they eat. Because uh, I've met a lot of people who they eat such a small amount of food. Um, but yeah, recidivism is difficult, and I think having like a, a social community helps. I had a volunteer that joined me for 18 weeks on the road, and uh, she was from like a very, very conservative area, and um, her whole family ate meat, and they were very conservative, and so she just got tired of fighting, of being the weird one, and she went back to eating uh, meat. It was very sad for me personally, but uh, I think that there was like a lack of social support, and that's why I think the Vegan Mentor Program, uh, online resources, online communities, because um, the, the the being the weird or the social stigma of some people in the middle of nowhere in the, in the countryside, uh, of always being the different one, the one that shows the mirror to other people, that takes an emotional toll on some people. So uh, being part of a community, I think, uh, is, helps a lot. Yeah, there are vegan hangouts uh, every now and then, on Sundays usually. Uh, like big, uh, Vegan Veneri Stockholm, or uh, Vegans in Stockholm, Veganeri Stockholm, those groups. Uh, so you can hang out with vegans, and uh, even we do sometimes social hangouts after our cubes. And if you're organizers, I think that's so huge. I started out as a community activist in uh, Philadelphia. And when I first went there, these people, I mean, I didn't realize at the time that they may, <laughs> they may have been doing illegal things, I don't know, but the, nobody was friendly. You know, people didn't ask me, what's my name, why are you here? And you know, I was kind of like an athlete at the time, so I was like this football player, and they all had like their anarchist patches, you know. So I didn't know if they thought I was undercover, what the case may be, but you know, people just weren't friendly. So now, well, a lot of people with first time they were activism, I think it's really good to like hold their hand a little bit, introduce them to everyone, thank them for coming out, uh, have a conversation, ask them about themselves, explain why we do the cube, why we leaflet, invite them to come to a, a, you know, a restaurant afterwards. It's not a cult. We're not, you know, we just want to be friendly. And uh, once people, even activists, have that social connection, that, hey, we're just hanging out here at the, uh, doing leafleting, we're at the cube, it, it becomes like it's not such a big, uh, it's not so much to overcome to get involved. So I think that that's, that goes back to the veganism, the vegan revolution is a social revolution. It has to be fun, it has to be social. You know, yes, it's serious, but you know, it doesn't mean that we can't have a beer and, and you know, go to the bar afterwards and tell a few jokes. Uh, I find that those people tend to come back a lot more often. Uh, any, uh, any other questions or comments? You guys are the best, by the way. Go ahead. Uh, I have a question about this uh, animal charity evaluators that you, that, um, you mentioned before. Um, I want to know a little bit. Do you know how, like, how they, uh, how they work when they uh, evaluate the different groups? Like, do they do their own research, or do they look at like? I, th I think it's a little bit of both. I actually need to call them because uh, I was at the Vega Mouse on and they said that our the vegan outreach's funding requirements are low. But you know, it's like the more money we get, we do effective uh, outreaches in other countries. So. Uh, I don't know the exact methodology. I know that there's been, a, you know, hopefully there'll be more research on the efficacy of, of uh, leafleting, but I think, um, you know, I think ACE, from my understanding, speaks to the charities and, you know, ask a bunch of questions. And, you know, they're very intelligent and they have a, a very high purpose. Um, and I think they do a great service to the movement overall. Because, um, you know, a tough question I've had sometimes is that um, there's like this proliferation of sanctuaries. and. Uh, you know, if it takes like 14,000 US dollars to take care of like one sick cow and there's two sick cows, you know, that's like, you know, we could probably reach like, you know, 250,000 students with that money. So sometimes it's tough when you ask people these questions because uh, they almost make a look at me and think like, I don't care about these two cows, but really we care about those two cows so much we'd rather save like a thousand than two kind of thing. So um, ACE, ACE does a good service, I think, of asking these very, very difficult questions. Uh, but you'd have to contact them a little bit more for their methodology. Sorry. Maybe I can comment a bit because with effective animal algorithm, we did uh, we had a workshop with uh, Jamie, right, from uh, animal uh, charity evaluators. They have their own processes and they actually review uh, with several procedures uh, each of the charities that they recommend. So it's like a four-step. Uh, program that they have, so they get a big list, and then they eliminate, and then they actually review, uh, and then they decide which are the charities that they would recommend uh, on their website. Yep. Or whatever. Yes, so they, they have a series of criteria that you can find on the website, yeah. and as uh, Nick was explained, so they start with a long list of charities that they want to like do a light research about, and then they will they will reduce the list uh, every every step and go go a little bit deeper. 
Um, and so for the for the charities that they thoroughly evaluate, they would reach out and have interviews with employees at different levels of the organization. Um, yeah, and you can find the, the reports on their website as well. Well, if you are a donor, I would love to talk to you because we're. Uh, I would love to help uh, get some more resources to Yoritz Allianzen and also. Uh, you know, vegan Irish, we're constantly expanding our programs and power activists and get them the resources. And uh, especially in like recently in uh, foreign countries, our next trip is to Ecuador and Peru. And you know, for a relatively low expense, we could reach. You know, we're reaching sixty thousand students uh, in this new trip. And uh, you know, so I really, you know, donating money is a very revolutionary activity that may not be so sexy, but of course, is you know the lifeblood of uh, so much activism. organic food is the health uh, uh, issue that is the most important. Like they choose organic because not for environment, uh, but for health reasons. And, um, and sometimes when I argue with people, many people say like, oh, but vegans, they are very unhealthy. <laughs> Omega-3, they have yeah. like B12. I mean, and then I say, I don't have any case. Like, do you have any like examples to tell them? like? Sure. To show that actually vegans can be healthy as well. Oh, absolutely. And, and you know, you can actually make a pretty convincing argument that veganism is the healthiest. F or, you know, you, you know, you can eat Oreos and McDonald's and be vegan, but like a healthy vegan diet. Um, this uh, doctor named Dr. Michael Greger wrote a book, How Not to Die, okay. which is a bestseller, which is phenomenal. Mm -hmm. And basically, he goes over the leading causes of death and then talks about how a healthy vegan diet addresses that. Uh, research has shown that most people go vegan that stay vegan, uh, for animal suffering, and then people go vegan for health. And what you've seen, especially in the United States recently, is that a ton of people that are older, in their 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, are going vegan because uh, the word is getting out there through uh, nutritionfacts.org and many other doctors that uh, you know dairy is carcinogenic, that um, you know uh, you don't have to. Eat. Well, I don't know. They have other one out of two people will die of heart disease in the West, and they have this phenomenal presentation about that shows if you do four things, you will be heart attack proof. If you had a whole, healthy whole foods plant-based diet, you put no animal cholesterol, no saturated animal fat in, and you make sure you get it enough uh, B12. And people always, you know, after you do the whole Gary Yavrosky, how natural, we're natural uh, omnivores, um, you know, and, and it's interesting too to be like, you know, okay, you're a carnivore, go ahead. Let me put you out in uh, Haga Park and you go, you go kill something and eat it raw. You know, it'd be disgusting. You know, explain to people that you salt it, oil it, mix it with other things, you cook it. Even a grilled meat by itself is like plain and, and gross. But as it relates to uh, diet, after you explain the whole we're not natural uh, uh, carnivores to people, they ask like, okay, well, okay, what about the whole B12 thing? If it's natural for us not to be carnivores, why do we need B12? And a lot of people don't realize that animals don't need it because it's in the dirt. Um, and that's what, you know, and B12 is super important to get. A lot of people that are even meat eaters don't get enough B12. Um, so for the, to be relatively heart attack proof, it would be healthy whole food plant-based diets. So you're getting no cholesterol, no saturated animal fats, and you want to make sure you're getting enough uh, B12. And, um, you know, vegan diet is not always a panacea. One problem is that a lot of vegans have horrible omega-3 to 6 ratios. Uh, and uh, salmon is very famous to having a lot of omega-3s, but mo the overwhelming majority of salmon we eat comes from like Norie, and it, uh, it, the, the ones made in those uh, fish factory farms only have 12.5% of the omega-3s of wild-caught fish. You know, wild-caught fish is not good, obviously, because uh, women can't have it. Why can't women have fish? Because it's full of those toxic uh, mercury, cadmium, heavy metals. But um, uh, the, the most... Uh, most meat eaters had something like an omega-3 to 6 ratio of something like, you know, 1 to 4, 1 to 8. Vegetarians, it was like about 1 to 12. And then they did a study of vegans, and it was like 1 to 44. So their hearts were actually in bad shape. And as like a vegan talking about health and stuff, I was like, this is not good news. And, um, but the, so that was the bad news, even though you put no, no cholesterol, no saturated animal fats. The good news was, if you ate to get enough omega-3s, and get B12, your heart health was like perfect. Because the B12 minimizes your homeocysteine, which is a neurotoxin in your heart and your brain, leads, can lead to Alzheimer's. And uh, so the solution was to eat ground up flax meal. It's super high in ALA, 
uh, omega-3. So there's recommendations by this famous doctor that every vegan should have uh, two to three scoops of uh, flax meal in their oatmeal or whatever they eat a day. It could be heated, it doesn't matter. Uh, you can buy it in the supermarket, ground up already. It just, once you open it, it has to be refrigerated. And uh, if you do that over the course of time, your omega-3 to 6 ratio will be perfect. You know, you eat a healthy whole food vegan diet, meditate five minutes, exercise. Uh, statistically speaking, your heart will beat another 12 to 16 years or something. No? Am I wrong? No, I'm, sorry. Uh, I'm just saying that I would be just a month healthy. Okay, no. We need Problem you here. The is that in Sweden, most stores have stopped selling grown flax because of a cyanide concern. Ah. The National Food Agency uh, has gone out with a statement that they know, don't know if it's safe or not to eat. And so all the stores have removed it from the shelves. Oh, that's unfortunate. Well, hopefully people can order it on Amazon then. Yeah, I have an idea about those, like how to handle those people are really critical about that. Maybe it's a good idea to just list a bunch of famous like athletes who are mm. uh, who are obviously like super healthy and are vegan. Like for example, like Serena Williams, she's yeah. vegan. Yeah. I know Bill Clinton went vegan when we had when he had like heart problems. He had quadruple heart bypass to like open up his arteries again because the healthy vegan diet like Dr. Greg can actually like reverse certain heart diseases and this is kind of where it comes about like I care about you the human element like you know there's people who have had asthma they went vegetarian nothing happened they went vegan it was the cheese you know their asthma's gone it's not gonna happen to everybody but high blood pressure you can take disgusting pills for 18 years or you can change your diet can, it can reduce it so a lot of people don't know this type 2 diabetes I believe 85% can be reversed with a healthy whole foods carefully planned plant-based diet so uh, there's a paucity of information you know on television you see advertisements for McDonald's you don't see advertisements for health and uh, this last little tidbit I think is very interesting uh, when they did the studies of trying to get children not to smoke cigarettes they kept telling them you know it's not bad for your health you're gonna be sick later you're gonna get butt cancer you know it didn't really have a it didn't it didn't you know people were just like I'm cool I'm smoking cigarettes and they found one thing after all these years that was super effective in getting children not to smoke, and that was to say that you're being lied to. These corporations are manipulating you, and, and, and when they said that these corporations are using you and, and playing you for a fool, that's when people are like, well, I'm not going to be played for a fool. And I think it's similar to when you talk about the human health thing, that there's all these studies that soy is going to give you gigantic breasts. You know, I've had friends joke that, like, oh, I need to, you know, whatever, uh, eat more of it. But uh, there's so much propaganda out there, and the... Uh, smoking industry, they paid to get surveys done, uh, not to say that smoking was healthy, but just to plant doubt. So there's all these soy surveys and all this crap that's paid by like milk producers uh, just to sow doubt in the public mind. Uh, but then the big question really becomes like, who are you going to trust for your health, yourself and uh, progressive people or, or, you know, these corporations who, uh, you know, they get us sick and then we got to pay all this money to, uh, or, you know, go to the doctor. So. Uh, so I think uh, a little educated stuff, but even when you said you talked to him, you said you had an argument, you know, so uh, I don't know how, you know, I, I don't know, I don't think you said that in intentionally, but I think it's interesting what the, I'd be curious to know more about the dynamic of how the you conversation went. You sometimes about myself, but why do you choose to eat vegan? Because your health will not be good in the future and think about your future child and things like this, like really obsessed, uh, like, um, upsetting arguments and I'm trying to like say oh I'm eating B12, I'm eating omega-3 I'm really trying to tell them like mm. I'm doing my best mm. and if I'm dying with, like early on I mean at least I do something for the animals well I think you if can I do my best I mean mm. uh, what well, yeah please go ahead Simon so there's I mean what what I usually do I, I don't know people that, that give those arguments but um, what I usually do is to to um, redirect them to the uh, uh, ward guidance. It's, okay. uh, so they have like a page where they talk about uh, what sort of nutrients you might be lacking yeah, uh, yeah. if you vegan or vegetarian. Mm -hmm. uh, and they describe it like, yeah, so if you just make sure that you get all of these things, then you're fine. Yeah. And the, well, this, well, I think it's also important not to paint it as a, a lack. To be like, you know, the American diet, well, you know, it's America, unfortunately, but like the American Dietetic Association said that, that uh, you know, a vegan diet is healthy for all cycles of the human living, including pregnancy. And uh, people always talk about like protein deficiency, but it's like, you know, people have an excess of so much stuff. Like it's, it's like a mental floss. It's like you have to counter it. Um, important to try to educate but not put, don't portray it as a lack like I have to you know search around the, the closet for B12 you know that that uh, all 
amino acids come from the ground. Yeah. You know, uh, another thing we didn't mention that, that a lot of people um, really surprises them is when you ask them like, well, what are the strongest animals in nature? You know, gorilla, you ever been up close to a horse, I ask people, see those huge muscles, all the, you know, it's like it's completely vegan because, um, you know, all, all amino acids start in the ground and we don't have to filter our nutrients through a dead body. So, uh, you know, kind of portrayed maybe not as like I'm lacking in this stuff, but that I have, I'm trying to help you see what you've not been told on TV. Like you could be happier, healthier, the food is delicious, you know, portrayed in kind of a, a positive way maybe. But, but I hate to say it, but some people are looking just to you know, poop on you. They're, they're, they're not always receptive. And I think sometimes some people, especially in my colleagues, they like feel a little bit threatened, you know, sometimes. I'm like, but I at least eat uh, like wild, uh, uh, like meat from, like I have a person that hunt in my area mm -hmm. and I buy the food from them or I eat organic food or I eat this diaries and cheese from a small farm. Well, that, well that's, uh, that's why we hold have an argument with them. They're like trying to convince me that I know. they're doing good. But I was like, yeah. Well, I think it's interesting that we hold that mirror to people for their ethics, yeah. and that's where like the 1090 rule can then come up where you're like, oh, that's great that you're getting organic food is much healthier for you, or uh, you know, even when I talk about fish, sometimes I'll be like, oh, you know, if you eat salmon, did you realize wild caught salmon have a uh, you know is much healthier for you for these reasons, you know, just to give them like a little 10 percent, mm -hmm. and then be like, but I wouldn't eat salmon because of all these reasons. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought. But uh, the, the more you engage in dialogue, friendly. Over the comments, sorry, you want to say something? Uh, yeah, uh, I always tend to recommend the people to watch Forks overnight. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. Yeah. You want to say something? Or? Yeah. It's a really eye opening. You can also watch documentaries with people, which I've done a ton of times. Like they may not, you know, my mom, my dad, or my uncle, they may not want to watch it, but I'll be like, oh, you know, you've been having, uh, you know, these issues. Like, why don't we hang out together and watch it? And like, I'm not dying to see Earthlings the 86th time, but like, uh, it's very helpful, you know. Uh. There is also a website called uh, Chronometer, uh, or an app, chronometer.com. And there they have like a huge database uh, of the nutrients of each of a lot of foods, like vegan or non-vegan, mm -hmm. and uh, you can you can try it out uh, yourself mm -hmm. and see like all the the vitamins, everything. Mm -hmm. And basically, if you compare if you compare like uh, meat and uh, uh, and vegan stuff, I actually tried that with a colleague at work, and he said, "What is this vegan propaganda?" Uh, the, the site is totally neutral, you know, it's like, so you can try that out maybe. No, and I think a lot of the things we talked about, you can talk about your coworkers, like, are we naturally carnivores, you know, like, ask them the questions and go through the body and then, then mention how, like, you know, not me the vegan woman, you know, but like Harvard Medical School said your heart will be 12 to 16 years longer if you do these four things and, you know, just, just educate people and be like, I care about you, like, I would, you know, I would want you to live longer, spend more time with your children. Uh, you know, it's not just about, you know, my life and you know did you ever think about all these animals that are so strong where they get their protein from you know just ask them more questions and be friendly and you know give them time and also just google like vegan options of omega-3 for example yeah. i just got chia seeds hemp seeds and seaweed and beans walnuts like, just google each, each but one. some they say like, i really try that as well but they also say that the vegetarian options of omega-3 is very hard to um, change like like change into the body so the body can like, absorb it. Yeah. So I mean, mm -hmm. the, the omega-3 from the sea is much more efficient. That's what they say. Well, there, there is, uh, yeah, there is in the supermarket seaweed burgers. Yeah. So they can try that out. But yeah. Yeah. Who are these people? Are they philosophical? Are they doctors? Or <laughs> no, I don't just regular people. Regular people. Yeah. I don't know why that is so complicated. <laughs> yeah, <they are. laughs> well, I think it is interesting because people will like look to tear down like your veganism and that's why like you can also ask them, like, you know, do you think that, you know, what is good about a vegan diet? You know, what do you think could be healthier? And then be like, well, you're not putting, you know, your body produces its own cholesterol. One out of two people die of heart disease. You could live long, you know, it's like, just try to engage and ask questions. Martin, you have a solution? Uh, no, I, I'm an expert in health, uh, but I, I uh, eat these capsules. And they are highly recommended. They are from seaweed, but uh, really concentrated. Uh, so that's an option. I mean, you can also tell fish gets their omega from the seaweed, so it's just to take them a bit earlier. Mm. Yeah, we can get the nutrients ourselves from the ground. We, like, we don't have to go through a dead body kind of thing that suffered and uh, 
if I had to vote of everybody in this room who's going to live to 100, I would vote for Martin. <laughs> he's so healthy. He's, he's chewing his food, you know, like really carefully. I felt guilty. I felt like I was like, this, this, I felt like an ogre, just like just shoveling everything in. Another, yes, to, to say that this book that uh, you recommended, uh, uh, it's also in Swedish, Constant and uh, I've been vegan for 11 years and I've been talking to animal rights with my family uh, equally long. But it hasn't uh, done uh, much <laughs> effect. Yeah. But then I gave this book to my mom and my twin brother, and that had a huge effect. Okay. She calls it her Bible. <laughs> and she's over 70 years, and she's really she's not completely vegan, but she has taken many many steps in uh, the right direction. Uh, and I, in my personal experience, the the health argument has been more powerful sometimes for older people who have high blood pressure, who may have some, you know, and, and uh, there's a lot of misconceptions there, just like, you know, people ask all the time about calcium and your bones, but it's like, that goes back to the whole, like, we're being lied to. You know, the more, all these w women tend to get more osteoporosis as they age, and so they drink more milk and they have higher rates of osteoporosis, so you can always weasel in the, you know, the dairy propaganda. Since we're talking about how to talk to different categories of people, how do you talk to people who are like the super sporty people and who are like, oh, I can't get my 3,000 calories in, I can't get enough protein, they literally say that, and I'm really? like, you cannot like protein, and they were like, yes, but I need extra. Well, we have, um, well, I think it's to, uh, A, to agree with them. Be like, if you're lifting weights or you're an athlete, you need to get more protein than most people. Uh, you know, I think it's like 2.1 grams per pound. I don't know, it's different, I'm sorry, it's kilograms here. But um, we actually produce a booklet called uh, uh, vegan a of, by Vegan Athletes. And it says like 300, uh, you know, 180 kilogram guys that are muscled out. And uh, so pictures worth a thousand words is veganbodybuilding.com. Um, you can explain to them, like, do you know where protein comes from? And they'd be like, yeah, from animals. And you're like, oh, actually, all amino acids come from the ground. And, um, you know, there's people, the, the guy that, Patrick Baboonian or whatever, like all these po people have the bench press record, you know, they're vegan. Because they, they don't, you know, they imagine a vegan, they think they're like, you know, gaunt and sick, you know. Uh, so sometimes, so it's, like, it's an information war. And also being friendly and just like, yeah, you know, okay, you, you, certainly you need more protein, but did you know that, you know, you don't have to get this protein that's going to clog up your arteries and you might look good on the inside but you start to rot on the inside and you know because I care about you I would want you to be healthy and you know check out this website and you know you care about them agree with them a little bit and then give them the, you know give them the information bomb and uh, you know how can they how can they disagree with you yeah they just always grab my oat product I'm not there's not a lot of protein in that <laughs> there's, there's also a website called uh, truenutrition.com where you can get these like gigantic tubs of protein that are inexpensive because like people have this like obsession with whey which is disgusting and unhealthy mm -hmm. and uh, you know pea protein rice protein all this other stuff you know and some people are just like oh I could never have soy I'm like well I don't I'm, I don't need soy either you know it's just like uh, but what bothers me sometimes is you get that dynamic where people are they're rationalizing not their own behavior change and so you kind of want to shift you know you, though you can do all those three different tactics agree inform but you can also shift and be like well what do you think would be beneficial about bodybuilding on a vegan diet like have you ever thought about it then uh, you know explain those things and, and show pictures of the people that are so muscle bound and hopefully they're receptive um, I find that most people that say kind of stuff like that initially they're like just trying to rationalize their own behavior but, but those Socratic questions are deadly, like what are the strongest animals in nature? You know, do you think a horse eats meat? Do you, you know, have you been up close to a horse? Like it just softens the brain and, um, you know, just don't give up talking to them, I would say. And, and also there is a, a documentary or a movie coming out later this year, it's called Game Changer. Oh yeah, yeah, I saw that. Yeah, um, and, and, and you could also do like the whole, uh, non-defensive thing be like oh yeah I used to think that same thing too now I see you know all these world-class athletes that are vegan I, you know I never realized that you know protein comes from the ground not from animals you know like so you can you can play you know you can play the game a little bit you, you know in that way as well I'm sorry were you gonna say something Me? yeah yeah I think you said like the, when you were asking how can I explain to people that uh, it's okay to eat vegan the World Health Organization you said the American Society, but I'm sure that also the World Health Organization says like there's this sentence, 100% uh, plant-based diet is, uh, I don't know it in English, but it basically says it's okay in every stage of life, including pregnancy, childhood, and I think it's good if you also find an example, like I have a nephew, he's one year and a half now, and he has always been vegan. Because like, you know, I showed them the video of him super happy and like super strong, and, 
But okay, I get that not everyone has a big enough. But if you have a good example, mm -hmm. I mean, even yourself, yeah. especially if you have like data of your blood analysis, mm -hmm. like, okay, this is data, this is data. Mm -hmm. so you can also invite people to try it for, tell you, like, oh, I got so much more energy when I was vegan. I felt a little, you know, my body adjusted for a week. Like, you know, try it slowly or try it for veganuary in January. Uh, you know, just don't, like, not, not to let people see veganism as, like, a threat. But, like, oh, yeah, I thought I was, like, what the hell was I going to eat? And now I have all this delicious food to eat. And, like, you know, I wish I did it earlier. And, you know, I eat, I eat most of my life. You know, you mirror them. That, like, you know, it's just, I think it's just being personable. And it's not what you say, it's how you say it. You know, just, like, making friends and, yeah. and schmoozing about the issue. Um, well, well, I can't thank you all enough. You're the best. It's so beautiful, uh, all the activism happening there. And uh, thanks for letting me drone on. And uh, any other things we want to discuss together? Or? Thanks for. I fly out tomorrow, but uh, I'll be back in September. We're going to try to do a, a college leafleting tour with Yurits Allianz, most likely. So we'll go on. To, we'll go on to all the big schools in uh, Stockholm as well. But that'll be most likely on like weekday morning. So even if you have half a day, uh, if you want to come hang out, leaflet together, you know, I'd love to do that. Absolutely. <laughs> and uh, nice. Hey, <laughs> hey, if you invite me, I'll be there. Um, I like to say I travel a lot because I get, get annoying after two to three days, so it works out well. I, I'll, get, I'll, give you my, uh, I'll give you my email if you uh, have any questions or you want me to put you in touch with anybody or what have you. Uh, at or if you come to California or the States, you want to do some activism or meet people. Uh, we've had people intern from other countries. We don't pay that much, but it's a great adventure. There's space between the C and the S. No. No. Vic S. No space. No space. Yeah. I tried to write really neatly. So <laughs> 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 thank you so much, Victor. All right, thank you guys so much. You're the best. <laughs>